Hi, I'm Thomas. Welcome to the Parachute Advice Podcast. My life has taken a lot of twists and turns, and on this podcast, I will dive into those experiences. The goal is to help everyone listening learn from my experiences and hopefully avoid some of the mistakes I've made. Hi, welcome to today's episode of the Parachute Advice Podcast. I'm your host, Thomas. On today's episode, I'm going to talk about something a little different. So for the last few episodes, we've been talking about diet, weight loss, the plan I used, the tools I used, the food I ate, the recipes I cooked. Today, I want to talk about health overall. As I mentioned in the first episode, my dad died of a massive heart attack when he was 49 years old. As I'm approaching that age, I've thought about this a lot. I've spent most of my life under the assumption that the same thing was going to happen to me. And I think I've touched on this, but that fatalistic view drove a lot of my decisions. To be frank, I I didn't care about my health. I wasn't worried about my health. I figured, what did it matter? I'll eat, I'll drink, I'll party, I'll do whatever I want, because at the end of the day, I'm going to follow the same path he did, and I will likely be dead of a heart attack by the age of 50. Well, here I sit, 200 pounds lighter, working out every day, and frankly, the best shape of my life, and, and probably the best health I've ever been in, And now it's starting to set in. Age 49 is coming up really fast. When I was 11 and my dad passed away, age 49 seemed a lifetime away. Now, it's only six years away. So the first thing I did is during my annual wellness exam, I asked my doctor for a referral to a cardiologist. I figured at the very least, it would be good to meet a cardiologist, talk about my family history, and build that relationship for the future. Why was it so important for me to do this now? Well, Let's go all the way back to the beginning and how this story started when my dad passed away. It was March of 1990. He woke up on a Saturday morning with severe chest pain and shoulder pain. Did he rush to the hospital? Unfortunately, no. He decided to go about his day and see if he could power through. Even going as far as taking me to music lessons that morning and then heading back home. At which point, he talked to my mom, his wife, and they decided he should go to the emergency room. Little backstory there, my mom was a nurse in both the U.S. Army and for a local hospital for over 20 years. So when she used to say it was time to go to the hospital, you knew it was urgent. So ultimately he went in. And there we sat on a Saturday afternoon having a conversation to this day I'll never forget. My dad was in the emergency room. They were doing a workup. I was 11 years old having a snack in the cafeteria with my mom and sister. My sister's about two years younger. And my mom looked at me and she told me something I'll never forget to this day. She said, always remember what room the person you're here to see is in. And listen, if you hear them call code blue and that person's room, rush back. It means they're having a massive heart attack or something worse. So there we sat in the cafeteria listening and wondering what was going to happen with my dad. They ultimately admitted him to the hospital where he spent about a week. He was transferred to another hospital that had a better heart care center to do a full workup. They ultimately determined that he had four massive blockages in his heart, and he was going to have to have quadruple bypass surgery. As that day approached, as a family, we talked about it, but the reality was we we all made the assumption it was going to be surgery, and it was going to be fine, and he was going to come home. The plan was he was going to check into the hospital on Palm Sunday, April of 1990. Monday morning, he would have quadruple bypass surgery. They anticipated he would be in the hospital for a week or two and then he would come home for a long recovery, but afterwards should have a great, long, healthy life. At the time, that was the primary way they fixed massive blockages was bypass surgery. So the day finally came, and I'll never forget, for the first time in my life, I saw my dad cry. He sat me down privately with no one else around, and he said to me, I'm not coming home. I don't know why, but I'm not gonna make it through this, and you're gonna have to take care of the family and be there for them. And that was it. That was a conversation we had. And he went into the hospital that afternoon and surgery was on Monday. Me and my sister went to school like normal. And then about one in the afternoon, we got called to the principal's office. Our cousin was coming to pick us up. We had to go to the hospital. The surgery had been a success. They had put him on a heart lung machine, which basically operates as an external heart while they stop the heart and do the repairs, but they couldn't restart his heart. They had realized the damage was far more severe. Ultimately, we would learn that he had likely had a heart attack several years earlier that wasn't as severe, but had damaged a portion of his heart. That's when we got the news. The only way he was going to make it if he got a heart transplant. So now they had to figure out what to do. 
They found an experimental piece of equipment at the local hospital that was the center of excellence. And it was going to operate his, as his external heart until he could get a transplant. How long it was going to take, no one knew. So late Monday night, they transferred him. He would spend the next week in an isolation room. They had to leave his chest completely open with one inch hoses running in and out of it to a giant machine next to his bed. It looked like a dishwasher and that was his heart. We would go and visit him every day and in order to visit him, you had to go through a complete sanitation process and put on special gowns, mask, hair covering, gloves, booties, everything to go in and visit him. We couldn't risk infection because like I said, his chest was wide open, just covered with a blanket. He was doing well, as well as could be expected. He joked that one of, the, one of the things he could really use was just a beer. Well, Friday of that week, which ironically happened to be April 13th, Good Friday, there was a reporter touring the hospital talking about the cost of medical care and the need for more transplant donors. And my dad's surgeon thought this would be a great way to get his story out. So they interviewed him. That night, his story was gonna air on the news. One of the nurses was nice enough to sneak a beer into the hospital. She even went as far as putting his name on it as if it had come from the cafeteria officially for his room. And he sat and he watched himself on the news. It was the first time he saw the situation he was in. And I'll be honest, I, I think it was good. That day was great. He was very coherent, but I think that was hard on him. Ultimately, over the course of the weekend, things went downhill. And strangely, on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, April 15th of 1990, his heart restarted. I'm sure everyone listening thinks that's fantastic. I thought it was fantastic at 11 years old. The problem was his heart had been stopped for so long that it was filled with clots. And one of those clots went straight to his brain. And at 10.30 on Easter Sunday night, April 15th of 1990, he was declared brain dead. The only positive to come out of that was he ultimately went from the organ recipient list to the donor list. Two people got new kidneys out of it and someone got new corneas but I didn't have a dad anymore. We did an autopsy and the autopsy ultimately confirmed that he had likely had a heart attack several years earlier that went undiagnosed. We honestly think it was when we were doing a remodeling project and he complained about how sore his upper chest was and his shoulders after putting cabinets in all day. But he went to the doctor and the doctor said it was probably strained muscles from doing all the remodeling work. They gave him a muscle relaxant, he went home, he felt great in a few days, but it was probably a heart attack. So there I sat, 11 years old, no dad, and the realization that he had passed away of a heart attack, his brother several years earlier had at about the same age, and their mother many years early at about the same age had all died of massive heart attacks. And that's when it really set in. This was likely gonna happen to me. I let this overshadow most of my life. Like I said, many decisions I made were tied to this. I spiraled at times, behavior was bad, grades were terrible. As I've mentioned in other episodes, my diet was terrible. Ultimately, I got a lot of my life back together and I was doing well, but diet, exercise, smoking weren't things I was worried about. Working in the restaurant business and then going back to college for a bachelor's degree, I partied like crazy, drank heavily, ate whatever I wanted, chain smoked on a regular basis. Why? Well, I figured what did it matter? My fate was sealed. I might as well at least enjoy life. So that's what I did. I even put crazy arbitrary rules on my life. I had said to myself, I didn't want to do what my dad had done to me, as if it was his decision. So I vowed that if I didn't have a family by age 30, I wasn't going to have a family because I'd likely be dead by 50 and I at least wanted to see my kids graduate college. My dad didn't even get to see me graduate middle school, let alone high school or college. Do I realize how stupid that rule was in some of those thoughts? Now I do. But at the time, I was convinced my fate was sealed. And that was just how I was gonna live my life. All of this shadowed my life for years. I treated friendships like they were disposable. I treated my own personal life like it was disposable. This went on for years. I will have to say I'm lucky. My whole attitude around friendship and how I, I used to treat a lot of that as disposable has drastically changed. Today, I have an amazing group of friends in my life. Many of them are like family to me. Considering how much of my family I've personally lost to death, it's great to have such a close group of friends who can be family. But it's tragic that it took as long as it did for me to understand some of the things I was giving up or losing with some of my attitude and this view that nothing really mattered. And then like I said in episode one, I had the realization when I turned 40 that I had nine years left and it was time to make some decisions. And here I sit, 200 pounds lighter, healthier, working out, doing great, 
But now I have to live with the realization that I spent most of my life doing everything I could to not be healthy. So here we are, back at the decision to see a cardiologist. I went in and saw him. We talked about the family history. I told him, I have nothing that concerns me. I haven't had any symptoms, no issues, but I just kind of want to know. And he was in agreement with the extensive history that at the very least we should get some baselines. So we did an EKG, which came back as fairly normal. Frankly, my heart rate was a little slow, but he wrote that up to all the working out I do and all the weight lost. Now I wait. The next two tests are coming up. An echocardiogram to verify whether my heart valves are operating correctly and what the heart muscle does, as well as how the blood flow is. And then ultimately a heart CT scan with contrast dye to see if I have any clogged arteries. I'll be honest, this is the one I'm the most nervous about. I've spent most of my life not eating well. There's a good chance I have clogged arteries. It may mean nothing. It may mean something. I'll be honest, I'm going back and forth. Do I want to know or not know? But then I think about the fact that maybe this is the thing that saves my life. Maybe they find it just in time. I'll share a little story. Just about a month ago, I attended a funeral for a friend from high school. He was 43 years old and was found dead at home of a massive heart attack. That, coupled with the visit to the cardiologist, has me thinking. I I know this is the right thing to do, but I'll be honest, I'm freaked out. What if it turns out I am as bad off as I think, or have thought for so many years? The thing that scares me more is going through all these tests and finding out there was nothing to worry about. It wasn't my fate to begin with. Why does this scare me more? Because it means I spent all of those years stressing about nothing, wasting good time of my life. Yeah, I had fun, and there's a lot of things I wouldn't change, but I certainly wouldn't let the fear of death drive so many of the decisions I've made in life. So I guess when I close out this episode, I just want everyone else to think about that. Yes, we have things that happen in life that will overshadow a lot of our decisions, but don't let them shape you. I let one event shape so many decisions, and now I look back and wonder whether they were the right things to do, or if I handled it correctly. I'll never know, but I can go forward and work from there. Like I said, I will do the two tests, I'll get the results, and we'll know. Hopefully things are great, and there are no issues. Once I have all the test results, I'll share it with the audience. Like I said, hopefully it's great. If not, I'll go from there, but only time can tell. I'll leave you this one parting thought. Don't let possibilities or what-ifs shape your life. Live your life to the fullest and live in the moment. Yeah, I'm not saying be reckless, but don't let something that you have no control over affect every aspect of your life. Like I let the death of my dad affect mine. I'll end with this quote, again, from one of the greatest books I've ever read, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, a counterintuitive approach to living a good life. In the book, the author says, yet in a bizarre backwards way, Death is the light by which the shadow of all of life's meaning is measured. Without death, everything would feel inconsequential. All experience arbitrary, all metrics and values suddenly zero. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to you joining me for future episodes of the Parachute Advice Podcast. You can contact me at parachuteadvicepodcast at gmail.com. That's all one word, parachuteadvicepodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Instagram at Parachute Advice. Thank you for listening, and please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.